Welcome to our roundtable discussion on reforming uh, SME finance. I'm Martina Garcia, the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, and delighted to welcome such a stellar group of panelists to discuss a PAC agenda on SME finance. Now, some of you might have noticed, and this is the second roundtable on this issue and, uh, uh, in recent times, in recent weeks. Um, last time we, we had the British Business Bank prepare, uh, presenting the uh, report for the year and very much looking at uh, what uh, has happened on, in this space in the last year. This session, it's about discussing how to reform the system, yes? And, uh, and I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity, particularly with this group of panelists, to, um, to try to solve a bit more this uh, absolutely key issue for the prosperity of, uh, of the UK and, uh, and many other countries. Uh, I will say that the global economy even. And so I will start by introducing, by, not by introducing, but by asking each panelist to introduce themselves and to explain what is their role in the sector. Kevin, would you like to start? I would love to. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for the invitation to join the panel. Um, yes, Kevin Hollingrake, Member of Parliament for Thirsk and Malton, which is in North Yorkshire. Member of Parliament since, Parliament since 2015. Prior to that, 30 years in business, so SME finance was a key part of us trying to grow our business and some of the things that went well and went less well, um, you know, were, uh, were something I've really focused on in, while I've been in Parliament, really. So uh, co-chair of the All-Party Group on Fair Business Banking, uh, does a lot on SME Finance and also a member of the Treasury Select Committee. Right. Miriam. Uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation and I'm glad to hear that you are devoting so much attention to the subject of SME financing. I am the Senior Counselor on SMEs in the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship SMEs, Regions and Cities, and I'm responsible for the Center's work on SME and entrepreneurship financing. Our main areas of work are on data collection, tracking, and monitoring trends in SME financing and in SME policy development. Um, we also take a look through our analysis at different financing instruments for SMEs, and we provide high-level guidance to governments through our G20 OECD uh, high-level principles on SME financing. Great. Ross? Hi, Martina. Thank you, and thank you so much for the invite today. Uh, my name is Ross Brown. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship and small business finance at the University of St Andrews. Uh, I'm based in a research centre called the Re uh, Centre for Responsible Banking and Finance, and I've spent the last 15 years or so looking at uh, finance issues, access to finance within SMEs, and various issues related therein. So uh, I'm currently, I've just been commissioned by the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy to do a project looking at uh, finance and SMEs and the levelling up agenda. So I'll be touching upon that when I uh, share some thoughts. So thank you again, Martina. Thank you. And Darren, and should I mention then uh, we are very happy that you, you returned to our round table. So welcome back. Yes, thank you for having me again. Um, yes, Darren Park here. So I'm the Senior Policy Advisor covering finance, tax and economic policies at the Federation of Small Businesses. So access to finance, SME financing, debt and green finance are four very kind of pressing issues of 2022 that we're looking into quite deeply. And yeah, happy to, to discuss it in this panel. Excellent. So um, could I first start, what, what is your view on what are the main problems that uh, SMEs face in uh, financing themselves? What are, the, what are the problems that we need to... Uh, uh, to solve and the reforms that are needed in which areas? What, one of the areas we, we see often at FSB, and I think is seen kind of throughout the UK, it, if you look at the statistics, is our small businesses tend to have kind of an over-reliance on both traditional finance and their commercial lender. So what I mean by that is we, we often see small businesses will apply pretty much only for kind of overdrafts and uh, traditional bank loans. I, indeed, in the, in the quarterly surveys that we run, 
and track. And those are the two dominating forms of finance we see with alternative forms. So seed, angel, venture capital tend to be kind of in the single digits of respondents using it. Um, equally, we, we see that there is a kind of a reluctance to go beyond your commercial bank. So we'll often see that SMEs will apply for the loan from their bank. If they accept it, great, they've got the finance they need. If they get rejected, they're, they're, that is often kind of the end of the line. They, they kind of give up with their financing. So they're, they're, I think there needs to be kind of this exploration and use of alternative financing, as well as alternative financing lenders in SMEs to really bridge the gap between kind of demand and supply of finance, especially moving forward with kind of the traditional trends looking at kind of post-economic turmoil, SME lending tends to get squeezed, alternative finance lenders and alternative le um, lending styles are going to become increasingly important over the next few years. Okay. Kevin, I see you nodding. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, I think there are some fundamental flaws in terms of SME, SME finance in this country that don't exist in other countries. Um, we have such a massive reliance on big commercial banks in the UK in a way that none of the G7 countries have. So the number one issue between businesses and banks is trust. That's the number one issue. 73% of businesses in the UK, small businesses, would rather grow more slowly than borrow. That was a stat we, I think from the Federation of Small Business, actually, that we used in our report called uh, Scale Up to Level Up, which is about how we encourage more businesses to scale up. And so we see this massive trust disparity. Again, a report written by Rishi Sunak when, when he was about mentioned in 2016, talks about the UK being number one in the OECD in a study of 14 countries in the OECD for startups, um, the number of startups, but number 13 out of those 14 countries analyze we were 13th out of 14th in that league table when it comes to scale-ups which is the number of businesses that get to 10 employees or more within three years there's a fundamental problems there both for businesses themselves and opportunity and for the uk uk plc and productivity um, we know that sme is the engine room of productivity they're the ones that really shake up the bigger bigger businesses that's the key to it which means shaking up the entire economy i grew a business from a very small business to a large national business and the thing that kept us on our toes time and time again were new entrants to the marketplace, good, hungry new entrants. So we need to get these scale-ups going. The one big solution, with a number of solutions we come to in our report, but the one thing that's pretty groundbreaking, challenging banks are doing well and stuff, but they're all commercial banks. We need regional mutual banks, um, which are a big feature of Germany, Japan, the US, Switzerland. And uh, we saw post-2008, lending to SMEs in the UK dropped by 25%. Germany increased by 20% those, those uh, cooperative banks. It's back to the umbrella and this, uh, you know, the bank gives you an umbrella when it's sun shining and takes where it's raining. That's what happened in the UK. So we need a different model alongside the commercial banks, mm -hmm. regional mutual banks who have a much more patient relationship-based approach to lending to SMEs, which will help rebuild that trust. Great. Miriam, I mean, the OECD all over the place, comparisons. Do you agree with that assessment? Yes, thanks, Martina. Yeah, I think um, I can bring a little bit of an international perspective um, and, and, and say that, you know, the UK is not alone in, in this situation. Um, SMEs do tend to over, have an over-reliance on debt. Um, for many years, we've been advocating for a more diverse range of financing instruments and in the run-up to the pandemic, we had started to see a lot of progress in that area um, with alternative, different alternative financing instruments. Um, their uptake was increasing among SMEs um, across uh, different countries. But what we find in, uh, is that during the pandemic, uh, many of them, again, once again, resorted to, to debt um, because that's what governments were supporting uh, at the time in order to reach as many SMEs as possible very quickly um, to bring them their liquidity support that they needed. So I think um, one of the, I don't know if you would call it reform, um, but one definite um, big priority on the agenda that we see is a return to um, this, this effort to increase diversification of financing instruments for SMEs. It will help them become more resilient. It will help them 
um, overcome some of the hurdles, some of the, the debt uh, burden that many of them face as a legacy of the crisis at a time when they actually need to be investing um, to meet some of the challenges of the future, like digitalization and greening. So um, for, for me, that would be the top, the top priority uh, that I see today around, around the countries that we track. That, that, that's very useful. But can I insist a little bit? Do you, do, have you identified uh, this issue about the regional, regional mutual uh, banks? Do you agree that in countries where region, regional mutual banking is much more widespread, uh, credit to SMEs is more resilient? Well, actually, that's an area that we're just starting to look at now. Um, at the moment, we collect our data at the national level, but we're embarking on a pilot to, to look at uh, data at the regional level, where indeed, I think relationship banking is, is extremely important. And we do see disparities in, in how SMEs are being financed in different regions. Uh, there could also be room there for, for FinTech to come in and, and reach some of those underserved uh, communities as well. Ross, what, what does the academic research show? Well, to be honest, I think uh, it would tend to corroborate what um, Kevin has alluded to in terms of the decentralization within the banking system. And there's quite strong evidence to su suggest the countries with the most decentralized banking systems, Germany being the sort of cause celeb uh, that exhibits that uh, tendency, tend to have a more a relational based banking system. In other words, bank managers and account managers get to know the company base, they understand them, they work with them to overcome their financing requirements. Now in the UK, as Kevin alluded to, we have the most centralized banking system in Europe, uh, dominated by four banks and in Scotland it's two banks. So there's very little competition and it's all based on transactional based banking. In other words, it's all automated and credit score based. So there's very little understanding of the local uh, business community. And that's what enables uh, strong relationships to take place in places like Germany. Um, we have examples of that, like Handels Banking from Sweden, which has moved into the UK and it implements that form of banking. But it's quite unique to certain countries and it's quite distinctive and different from the UK. And I think we suffer uh, as a consequence of that. And that's why suggestions like Kevin's about regional mutual banks, I think, have a lot of uh, credibility if we're to take this issue seriously. And just on the spatial uh, front, the main credit uh, problems or the, the most acute credit problems in the UK are generally found in peripheral parts of the economy where the bank, bank branch network is thinnest. In other words, it's uh, northern parts of the UK economy and rural parts of the UK, which, which feature the strongest problems accessing credit and highest levels of things like borrower discouragement, which is when a firm needs funding, but thinks they won't have a chance of getting it. So I think, uh, you know, thinking outside the box in terms of policy solutions is an important way forward if we're to address this problem seriously, Martina. Yeah. And what will it take? Uh, I mean, first question, why don't we have regional mutual banking and other countries do? Because we've not, we've not, uh, we've basically parked regional policy in the UK for you know thirty to forty years, and uh, we'll see if this levelling up agenda will take it seriously again. But if we're to address some of these spatial uh, inequities in the UK, it's going to require policy, imaginative policy solutions uh, going forward. In my in my take on things, anyway. Mm -hmm. And how do we set them up? What is the idea there, Kevin? Um, sorry. Um, no, no, no. Cool. Uh, well, uh, yeah, good, I mean, good, it's really good to hear Ross's comments. And I agree with everything he said. Um, the, um, we do have, of course, mutual banks in the building society sector, and they're, they're very successful here, of course. Yeah. And we have less than we did because we, obviously, we all, lots of us took the opportunity to flog them off for a few hundred quid. Um, probably the best 20 years ago, really, which was seen as obviously a huge mistake. You look at what happens in Northern Rock and the and the like, and Bradford and Bingley. Um, but um, 
so it, there is a kind of template, but that's obviously some restricted to mortgage lending. And um, but um, there's a number one to set up already. And these people, so there's Tony Green at South Mutual, there's also the chief exec of the Regional Mutuals Association, uh, Jules Peck at Avon, Stephen uh, Maud at the, um, at the, well, the Yorkshire Regional Mutual Bank, Wales are establishing, the Welsh Government's establishing one now in Wales. Um, so there's lots of different initiatives. What they're short of is capital. And it, they just need pump priming. So there's a couple of ways we need to, so we've got the people who want to do it. They're, they're experienced financial services professionals who want to do it. Um, we've got the template. We know it works elsewhere. We just need some funding. Um, I think the Treasury is starting to get interested in this, but sees it as kind of maybe it's a romantic idea of banking. And it could be further from the truth. You know, it's as Ross said, the point is with big banks lend to big businesses because they get the they get the stuff in the format. They want the spreadsheets, the credit credit committees like, so lend, that's how they lend. And I, I absolutely agree. Um, with Miriam about a- equity lending as well, a- equity finance as well. But if we're focusing on debt finance just for now, this is a much better approach to it. Um, the Treasury could su- put some money into these. Now they need about 20, 30 million apiece to probably get lending. Uh, and they take investment, of course. And what could be better than a Yorkshireman like me who might have a few quid sat in a savings account, thinks, well, put it in the New Yorkshire Regional Mutual Bank. I'll probably get a similar level of interest, but I'll, I know it's going to go to lending to SMEs in Yorkshire and to building businesses in Yorkshire. And I think there's a really nice uh, circular part, a circular economy kind of message to that. But they all need some pump priming. So, you know, for me, a couple hundred million quid from the Treasury loaned to these businesses, which they'll get a return on. You'll probably get a return of, you know, uh, 2 or 3%, I would say, it, it, it even lent it slightly, slightly beneficial terms, but still um, would be something the government could see itself to doing quite easily. They'll get a return, and more importantly, they'll get some really important debt finance out, patient debt finance to businesses really in need, who will have far more trust because, A, they're not driven by shareholder needs when you see a downturn, which is what happened to the big banks, of course, and um, and having that relationship approach, you know, the, the one-to-one uh, bank manager who knows the business, and that's what businesses would prefer to see. So there's a few little obstacles left, but not many. Just make really money. I, I hope Rishi is listening. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I have mentioned um, it. Moving on sustainable finance, because of course, I mean, you know, this problem existed uh, um, before we all got um, so much more aware of the need to transition our economies quickly. Um, and uh, and I, I would like to have your views on whether the, the need uh, for uh, additional financing to help SMEs to transition is uh, qualitatively different than any other financing need. Hmm? And uh, that's one question. And the other, if it's more important than the growth need and therefore an additional uh, driver for policy intervention. Miriam, would you like to, to explain how, you, how you're seeing that uh, problematic at the OECD? Sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to. I mean, I think, I think you raise an important question because um, while well, SMEs in general, they don't always use the instrument that's best suited to their needs. What, what studies find is that, you know, they often rely on overdraft, as it was mentioned, um, and, and traditional lending, even for investments that would be better served by other types of instruments. And I think We've seen this play out also for trade finance and, and in the UK and other, and other types of finance. And I think it will be the same with sustainable finance. What we are finding is that the first, um, the first barrier for SMEs before the financial barrier for their, their transition to net zero is one of awareness, um, of understanding what are the concrete steps they actually need to take to green. It's a bit overwhelming. Um, you know, some of the best uh, things that the best support that they can get is through uh, in the early stages through non-financial services, um, advisory services to understand, you know, what steps they can take, um, what is the, the timing and, and the, the, the synchronicity of those steps. Um, and, and, you know, often there are consultancy services that, that can be supported through financial institutions to help accompany them on that journey. Uh, turning to finance, for sure, um, 
you know, I think it's very much dependent on the, their, the type of business, the size, the sector of operation. We've heard from some small businesses that they actually managed to get go carbon neutral without seeking external finance, uh, that it didn't cost them more. But that's not the case, of course, for, for other businesses that rely on, you know, expensive equipment that would need to be upgraded. So I think there we have to take a very differentiated approach. Uh, financial institutions, both public and private ones, are are very interested in this. They face their own pressures to, to green their portfolios. Um, we've recently launched a new platform on financing SMEs for sustainability, bringing together a number of public banks, um, including the British Business Bank, where there's a real uh, appetite for sharing knowledge among the financial institutions in this area on um, you know, what, what lessons can they learn from experiences elsewhere to save time, to leapfrog, and really accompany SMEs uh, along this, this journey. So as a starting point, um, yes, uh, we think it's, it's something that's very important. It's high on the agenda. It's uh, something that SMEs themselves are interested in when you ask them, when you ask entrepreneurs, they say they're interested and committed, but the actions don't always follow at the same pace. So they, they do need support in this area. Ross, any, any feedback? Yeah, sure. Uh, just some uh, observations based. Uh, this is not an area of uh, my my research covers, but just a couple of observations. Um, I think there's there can be a danger um, that uh, the the whole um, uh, zero carbon agenda and the environmental agenda can confuse SMEs. Uh, we've got in Scotland, we've got a new institution called the Scottish National Investment Bank, and it's a kind of mission oriented bank to help encourage uh, environmental uh, based type projects. And it's had a very low uptake, uptake of demand in the SME base because they see it as something for uh, for one of a cliche uh, for renewable wind turbine companies and stuff like that, not for a prosaic ordinary SME. But a lot of the time, investments in SMEs are uh, positive in terms of uh, environmental objectives. For example, a logistics company that uh, you know um, buys new electric vehicles, for example, just a crude example. But quite often, there's positive spin-offs in terms of the environmental benefits from investments in SMEs. So I think we don't want to... Uh, confuse the, the SME community by having a mantra that everything they've got to do has to be uh, has to be in accordance with the sort of environmental agenda. Uh, I think that could lead to some mixed messaging, uh, which sure. seems to be evident here. Darren, can you? Yeah, I mean, it really, yeah, that mixed message is, is a problem. I mean. I think, I mean, we saw the Treasury Select Committee last week, we had evidence of some energy experts talking about the reason we weren't um, continuing our gas exploration of new fields in the North Sea mm -hmm. was because banks had stopped lending for that purpose. Now, that's not a policy position by the British government. It's not a policy position of a bank based upon that asset becoming a stranded asset because there's no demand for gas. We know we'll need gas for decades. And we know, know, of course, now we need mm. to replace Putin's gas. So suddenly we've got this knee jerk reaction, oh, my God, we need gas. So I think it's totally wrong that we should, that banks should try and pick winners in terms of environmental goals and what they will lend money for. So they won't lend to this SME, SME because, mm. they're, because they're using natural gas and they will lend to this one because it's using electricity. That, to me, should be nothing to do with a bank. Yes, of course, if they can see... For example, that business is going to be a expanded asset. It's going to have no value in a few years because it's mining coal or something. I get that. But they should not be making those decisions based upon some kind of notional thinking among shareholders or amongst board of directors that we need to decarbonize our business and our supply chain and our customer base. That's, that is then um, probably inconsistent or doubling down on a potential net zero target. So I think that's one big word of caution I have in terms of some of the things we've seen. And we saw this post-2008, don't forget, where banks un unilaterally, unreasonably, 
pull money out of hospitality and property development and, and property speculators and, and investors and commercial property investors. Um, and really, we saw a huge uh, destru- uh, destruction of SMEs, uh, good SMEs, along with some SMEs that probably needed uh, some work into them. But, um, so that's the first thing I'd say. In t- so how do we get, make sure we get money to businesses to decarbonize? Well, I think one of the successes that we saw of the, of the COVID crisis was this template we had around um, being able to pump out money through the banks, back loans and COVID schemes. I think looking at that, those kind of schemes in the future, that if businesses um, are, are serious about taking forward decarbonization projects that make financial sense for that business, and they need some capital um, investment to pump prime that investment or to pay for that investment, there'll be a return down the road, then that's something the government should look at, I think, in terms of potentially a supported scheme that, again, we can we can pump out through the large commercial banks. This time, I would say not just the commercial banks. But if you remember, the bounce back loans and, and civil scheme, uh, bounce back loans, only went to, came, the money came through the term funding scheme for SMEs, which non-bank lenders such as iWalker and Funding Circle, these kind of people, couldn't access directly. Mm-hmm. So that kind of template improved to make sure all SME lenders have access to it and they lend basic businesses can borrow cheaply for decarbonisation projects that have been signed off by somebody to make sure there's no fiddle going on. Darren, any reactions to that? And I will come back to you, Kevin, on your point on that, because it's quite controversial. <laughs> Um, no, no, I agree with what Kevin said. I mean, access to the capital is going to be the crucial element, whether businesses, especially small businesses, invest in the transition. We, we surveyed earlier this year asking about investment plans over the next 24 months. And I, I, I think somewhat unsurprisingly, only, only 20% or so said they had plans to invest in decarbonizing or green capital for their business over the next two years. I, I do think it's worth just remembering kind of where we are in terms of the business climate. Small businesses have had a very rough two years and coming out of COVID, now there's the cost crisis made worse by the kind of uh, what's going on in Ukraine. Doesn't look like inflation is going to be easing up over the next kind of 12 to 18 months. It's the investment in degree, although no one is disputing that zero is an important long-term target, it's just not necessarily a priority over the next short-term period small businesses are still very much kind of kind of trying to struggle to survive and get back on their feet and recover post-pandemic and i think that is where most of the additional funding is going to go to in the short term should things like the beeble scheme be extended for green lending where lending is much cheaper and much more affordable those type of incentives i do think would make a massive difference to decisions of small business investment as it stands I, I just don't see kind of the current finance, the access to finance for small businesses being enough to incentivize large investments with very small returns on their investments at a time when recovery is king. Miriam, please go ahead. Yeah, if I may just react to, to what, what Darren and, and Kevin said, um, for sure, you know, um, greening is maybe not uh, front and center on the minds of SMEs at this moment of very high uncertainty. Um, but we have to remember that, you know, there have been national recovery packages rolled out around the world, you know, where there's a huge focus on greening, on other structural objectives, on digitalization. Um, you know, often those investments, uh, you know, complement each other. We refer to the twin transition of digitizing and, and, and going green. And so, um, you know, we, we think that there, that there could be scope to have, um, you know, complementarities between those types of investments. But what is a bit uh, worrisome is that in, in our latest analysis in our SME financing scoreboard, where we looked at the composition of those recovery packages, um, the, the amount of, of support devoted to SMEs is not very high, much less so than it was uh, in the rescue phase of, of the crisis of, due to the pandemic. So. Um, you know, there we need to keep keep that issue front and center on the mind of governments at this moment. I, I thought Kevin's challenge on uh, the bank shifting their their way of thinking and their business model towards uh, um, uh, the low carbon economy were very interesting because uh, for most people working on sustainable finance, obviously this is a sign of success. Yes. 
and is particularly a sign of success because uh, it's uh, been uh, is taking place without uh, legally binding commitments and just by the the peer pressure uh, the reporting obligations and the and the increasing ability to distinguish between uh, high carbon uh, intensive industries and uh, and that's more into the low carbon front or, or and right now we are seeing a, a very clear interest towards uh, spreading that towards uh, other uh, good ESG companies, whether it's not only on carbon, but whether it's on biodiversity, whether it's on social issues. And it is, it, it's a very interesting debate. Is that the role of the banks or not? The banks are responding to, to the regulatory pressures because you have people like the Bank of England very interested in, uh, in this type of approach and to um, reputation uh, issues and obviously to the ability of uh, being able to do it. So um, I, um, I, I, I do wonder uh, the, the, this dichotomy between uh, not uh, wanting, of course, to prejudice companies that are not that, and obviously with gas right now, it's, it's, it's the perfect example. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And, and the success of, uh, of a policy based on incentives and not on, uh, on binding obligations. I mean, I'll just be clear, I'm not against green finance directed towards businesses that want to decarbonize or that have solutions, new innovative solutions, even if it's not commercially viable. And that's what obviously the UK Investment Bank, um, Infrastructure Bank is absolutely there to do, to pump prime investments that wouldn't otherwise happen. But um, I'm, I'm just, I'm again, so I'm not against that, but I'm against withdrawal yeah. of support from businesses based upon some kind of notional, like you said, that, well, these businesses have got high carbon use. Okay, so the, a business in my constituency, York Handmade Brick Company, SME, employs 20 people. It's very successful. It makes handmade bricks, like all clamp bricks, but new ones. Um, it's got 20 employees. Uh, it uses natural gas to fire its bricks. Now, is it a bank manager that's going to come along and say, actually, we don't like, you use a lot of gas. And that's against our kind of policy. We want to decarbonize. And, you know, there's a risk weighting maybe attached to capital at some point for that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, um, and you know, this doesn't fit with our, our ESG uh, objectives, all that kind of stuff. Therefore, I'm sorry, you're going to have to bank elsewhere. And all the other banks will be saying exactly the same thing. So like that business, which is, is, uh, working within the regulatory boundaries, uh, that is doing fine, that's a successful business, um, that may want to decarbonize at some point, but maybe to hydrogen or whatever, but suddenly we pull the plug on it. I, that's what I'm worried about. So we just need to, to make sure there is uh, some consideration of this. Yeah. And um, don't get me wrong, if, if I'm making cars, of course, and the government comes and I'm using, I'm using uh, combustion engines and the bank comes to me and says, what are you doing? You're going to be out of business by in five years, in seven years' time when we get to 2030. So, you know, we're not learning money. That's a different thing again because you've got a standard asset situation. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking businesses that are complying with the regulations, with the law, that are, doing, that are not being not likely to be standard assets, but somehow have some uh, black mark against them set by some policy within the bank that says, no, we want you, uh, we don't want you to bank you anymore. And this might be set by, as you said, by the Bank of England. Some this uh, risk weighting, this capital, uh, um, you know, this uh, risk weighted assets or whatever, all that kind of stuff, and may feel, or it may just be shareholder pressure or, or a, a, you know, a, some thought leadership in England's the leadership team suddenly can turn the back on a, in a wholesale way from lots of very good SMEs that will be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Interesting. Uh, should we move? Uh, that is, it's interesting. Should we move to the debt burden discussion and go back to this idea of alternative financing equity versus debt and how how that dynamic is going to uh, play uh, at the moment where the debt burden is very significant in post COVID and inflation is going up and therefore real interest might not be going up but nominal ones probably will. You know, traditionally SMEs, most SMEs uh, are happy with debt finance. That's what they are familiar with. That's what they're uh, accustomed to. Uh, they have certain issues like a lack of collateral, 
uh, you know, asset and tangibility. Uh, they're opaque. We don't know, you know, banks don't know much about them in terms of their accounts, so it can be problematic. But most SMEs, unlike uh, the companies you see in Dragon's Den, want bank finance. They don't want to relinquish ownership of their firms. Um, it tends to be innovative uh, startups, uh, very high risk startups that want um, equity finance, which is a tiny part of the uh, investment piece. These can be very important for the economy, but I think policymakers try to uh, overinflate the importance of the equity side of things. It's for specialist types of companies. And I think it sometimes grabs too much of the attention within the media and within policy frameworks. I think there's a lot more we can do to support normal mainstream uh, bank lending. And I think a key problem uh, going forward is the notion, there's, over the last 10 years, there's been a increasing uh, levels of alienation from the bank uh, accessing external finance. And I think we have to address that because these high levels of borrower discouragement are acting as a huge handbrake in terms of the productivity growth within uh, the economy. So I think whilst there is a role for alternative forms of finance like crowdfunding, uh, angel, uh, VC, that is a specialist part of the investment piece. And I think if we're to address the chronic underperformance in terms of uh, productivity in the UK, we have to focus on the debt uh, uh, sector. That's my uh, strong personal belief anyway. So you think then the, the, the issue is not a, a lack of supply, but lack of demand and and, uh, and lack of demand because it's not a desirable... It's, it's both, Martina. It's, it's both and they feed into each other. Uh, it's a lack of supply, which then alienates companies leading to lack of demand. So we have to address both uh, ends of the equation really to uh, get these two uh, to meet uh, together, basically. Miriam, at the OECD, you mentioned it before, then uh, uh, there is also, uh, your analysis is then the, there is too much dependency on debt and not enough on equity. How, how does that match uh, what Ross was explaining? Do you agree with him or do you think SMEs, you mentioned before, SMEs might choose the wrong financing option for them? Well, where is the problem? No, I think I think Ross makes uh, a lot of good points, and and, and it's very uh, it's been well understood that most SMEs uh, do not look for equity finance for for different reasons. Um, I think, you know, what we what we saw through the pandemic through uh, demand side surveys was that demand appeared to be being met um, during the pandemic. Um, the you know lending we saw the outstanding stock of loans. Um, the growth in that in lending to SMEs uh, reaching records we hadn't seen before in the 10 years that we've been producing the scoreboard. Um, at the same time, we saw that demand um, was, was not that high. Uh, initially, it was, and it started to taper off. Credit conditions were very loose. Um, I think there's a few things that could be done. Uh, one is to look at uh, educating SMEs and perhaps considering also hybrid instruments um, that are not pure equity, that, that are quasi-equity that would be uh, more accepted by SMEs. The other is this question um, that Ross was mentioning, which is, is very relevant, this question of uh, discouraged borrowers, because um, even in the run-up to the pandemic, we saw that um, demand was sluggish and, and growth in lending was sluggish. And, and it's it's hard to understand, you know, to what extent that's that's coming from demand simply being met and, and you know, um, SMEs, their first option is not to take any external finance. They prefer to reinvest and they use their own internal funding. So it's, it's, it's important to try and understand exactly uh, how much of that, those, that picture is told by discouraged borrowers, which was certainly a very, um, you know, important piece of the puzzle uh, following the financial crisis in the early yeah. years following the financial crisis. Uh, today we don't we still don't have a very clear picture on that from our side, but maybe Darren um, yeah. is, you know can say more about that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just to comment on what Ross was saying, I think kind of 
the point on equity and the dilution of your business is definitely a key point where many small businesses don't venture into the world of equity financing. But I do think that the pandemic and the level of debt taken on by small businesses may change that over the next few years. If you look at the kind of sheer level of debt burden that the average small business now has after their Beebles or any other kind of borrowing they took over the last two years, for many businesses that wish to kind of grow and grow at a relatively fast pace, without the ability to borrow because they're already at a kind of debt capacity, equity financing is effectively the potentially one of the only other routes in which they can grow. So I think the demand side, I, I do expect to kind of tick up over the next few years. And indeed, this is what the bank of it, um, the British Business Bank found in their SME financing report that, that in 2021, the rate of growth of equity lending was far exceeded, I think, in the previous X many years. I don't see that trend necessarily stopping, slowing down probably, but I, I do think equity financing is going to have an important place to play while the debt burden is still so large on small businesses. Sorry, sorry, Miriam, what was the exact question you wanted to be on? I've, I've lost the train of thought. No, I think with this question of the discouraged borrowers, are we seeing, do we have the impression that demand is, is low? And that it's oh, yeah, less? yes. Or is it really because many, many businesses have given up? Uh, no, so again, we so we at FSB we we survey every quarter and we ask if you've applied for finance. And our Q4 2021, so December time survey, found that only nine percent of our respondents, which is around about a thousand thousand one hundred, so a really decent sized sample, only nine percent had applied for any finance in the previous three months. This is an all time low on our index, and I think the index goes back to around 2010 ish. So it, it is definitely kind of um, the appetite for borrowing right now seems very subdued. But again, I, I think that is largely due to the kind of the debt burden taken on by bounce back loans. Ross, you're dying to intervene. Go ahead. Yeah, no, thanks, Martina. Yeah, I just want to add into what Darren and Miriam said there. Um, I think they make very good points. I think there probably is an increase in appetite for financially distressed firms to get involved with equity finance because of their problems. But I don't see a lot of equity financiers willing to pour money into firms that are heavily indebted. You know, that, that will not be a preferable option for business angels or venture, certainly not venture capitalists. And uh, I wouldn't think business angels would have much appetite and that leads me to uh, the point Miriam made about, and I think this is very over neglected. I think there has to be more education given to SMEs about their financial options. We always think of expensive schemes and whims to put in place, uh, but it's quite often simple initiatives that are the most effective, like maybe setting up a stronger set of mutual banks across the UK, like more investment in educational initiatives. 50% of companies that are discouraged from investing are likely to get funding via a mainstream bank. And if we sit down with more SMEs and talk them through their options, I think there would be uh, lots of potential uh, wins in that uh, respect. And I think it's also important to remember uh, the, the most rapidly growing form of SME finance in the UK over the last 10 years has been credit card finance, which is clearly not a sustainable and a good option in terms of the long-term health of SMEs. So we have to educate SMEs about the sources of finance which are beneficial and good in terms of the long-term development of uh, companies. Do you agree with Ross' first accusation that politicians were too obsessed with business angels and venture capital? Um, well, we're obsessed with business angels. I mean, I think on the whole topic, I would say is a horses of courses thing, isn't it? I mean, most of the businesses I've built have been, I've sold equity in them, um, I've taken debt finance and equity finance. I think, first of all, you've got to start at the starting point. Is this a lifestyle business that's going to produce a return for the owner, or is this some, a business that's going to scale? And I think if it's a lifestyle business, probably you're not going to have many takers who are going to think, okay, that's a good place to put a bit of investment as an angel investor or the like. So um, so I think 
so I did, but the first thing we're going to do then for is increase the number of businesses we want to scale. Then you'll see more, more people willing to take equity finance and, and be attracted by the idea of that. Um, and that's back to that statistic earlier, which is you know, we're very poor in terms of scale-ups in the UK. We've got to look at some of the barriers uh, that stop businesses scaling up. There's one obvious barrier that, I, that is really a big elephant in every room in these kind of discussions that we've got. We say to businesses, if you build your turnover more than £85,000, you're going to be worse off. The VAT threshold. It is a massive policy mistake. In Germany, the VAT threshold is 25,000 quid. This is a controversial thing, and lots of SMEs so cry, oh, my God, get rid of the VAT threshold. Get it down to 20 grand, whatever, and let's get everybody on a fair and level playing field. And there's no barriers to expansion then for people thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to close three months of the year or not employ the extra person. And so get more people scaling up. Give people easy, better access to debt finance, make that easier. Get people, get businesses more, more appetite for growth, and then I think they'll get to a point more quickly that they write. Okay, another way to do this through education, through some of the people on this call, not least the Federation of Small Businesses. Here's a way you can scale up without being too risky, borrow from mutual banks or equity finance, and because somebody's then got a proper skin in the game. Um, I mean, one of the great things we have in the UK that encourages equity finance, definitely angels programs and the government putting money into regional angels programs on a fund match basis. That's great. But all but EIS and SEIS are fantastic vehicles for SMEs who want to grow and for investors who want to invest because there's always some tax breaks and some, um, some cushioning of, of loss for businesses. So really pushing that further, making it more attractive, maybe certain parts of the tax breaks even more attractive in different parts of the country. So maybe you have an enhanced tax break for EIS and SEIS, say in the areas you want to level up, which would really be a sensible thing. Um, maybe you have an EIS ISA where you attract more, it makes it easier for just uh, everyday investors to put some money into, into funds that would fund businesses that, attract, that want to attract equity fundraisers to, to increase the amount of money that's going into these kind of businesses and and um, so there's lots of things we can do like that. But the first thing you've got to do, in my view, is, is uh, increase the appetite on SMEs to grow. Mm -hmm. your, your point is an excellent transition to the last point of the agenda on fintech. Yeah? Because a lot of these ideas about, well, how to better allocate between uh, savers and, uh, and investors, obviously fintech seems at first sight to have quite a big role to play. And, uh, and we have seen uh, significant revolutions on the retail payment. We are seeing it on the SME corporate loans, but how much more there is uh, to do that? What, what do you think are the prospects for FinTech to further uh, bridge the information gap, the optimum allocation, the, you know, all these type of issues that we have been discussing? Um, who wants to start? Maybe. No, I'll, I'll, I'll chip in with a few yeah. observations, Martina. Uh, I mean, I think fintech is seen as this uh, uniquely distinctive animal, uh, when in actual fact, uh, it's uh, it might have started off like that. But basically, all the big banks are becoming fintech businesses in one shape or another. So I don't think they're... Um, Whilst there were some qualitative differences between the mainstream bank and a, you know, a crowdfunding platform, for example, or lending platform, uh, I think there's going to be more of a, um, there's going to be more of a uh, pulling together of fintech under the guise of the mainstream banking system. That's just my own viewpoint going forward. I think uh, lots of uh, mainstream banks are buying into fintech companies. Uh, because of the um, the technology and the cost savings, but as banks eventually um, de uh, branch their networks, they're effectively becoming like fintech businesses. So I don't see them as a hugely distinctive animal. Right, I agree. I agree with what uh, what Ross said. Um, we do see that there are certain areas where fintechs can can help uh, serve. SMEs. Um, one is in, in you know, the speed, the, the digi digital nature of the platform, even if these are now being integrated with, with mainstream banks. 
and other areas in terms of assessing uh, credit risk through alternative data. Um, you know, that, that's a, a very a promising field. Of course, there are some privacy concerns there that, that need to be addressed on the usage of, of, of data. SMEs are not always well um, informed and well prepared to, to face those kind of risks. Uh, I think governments can, can place a greater, um, keep them in mind more, let's say, when they, they're channeling their support. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most of the support during the pandemic went through traditional banks, even if you know, there are some cases where fintechs or alternative providers were able to tap into that. I think that, that's, a, that's, that's a key point. Um, so all of those areas, uh, and the last point, maybe also um, reaching the, you know, certain segments of the market that are not currently uh, well served in certain remote regions um, where there may not be enough availability and competition among banks and so on. Um, certain types of entrepreneurs, uh, women entrepreneurs or other un underserved groups, they um, find solutions with, with fintech. So I think the promise there spans a lot of different areas. Uh, it's something that we need to keep a close eye on um, and for governments to keep in mind. Donald, do you agree? Yeah, I, I mean, think, I think small business engagement with fintechs um, falls quite similarly with their engagement with non history banks. I, I, I think they're... It's, it's, sorry, it's hard to generalize the small business community because you, you end up getting the kind of really high tech small businesses which who engage on fintechs and who they in themselves are the fintechs. And you have fairly kind of old traditional uh, small businesses who are relatively set in their ways with how they do the banking, how they're financing and access to finance. But I, I do think pre-pandemic, there was this general shift away from high street banking to alternative challenger banks, fintechs being the growing area and fintechs kind of remaining one of the growing areas. There is, I guess, concern over with the rollout of the bounce back loan, Siebel's and everything, if it's cemented the high street bank's position once again, given the influx of accounts back to them. Hmm. I would expect to see over the next few years that the trend of moving away from the main high street banks returns. It, it may return at a faster pace than before, given the fact that open banking, making tax digital and the general kind of digitalization of the economy is really into full swing and people are more accustomed to it following the work from home and digitalization of the economy over the past two years. So I, I do think fintechs are going to become increasingly important to kind of how small businesses access finance and just generally do their businesses, run their businesses. Okay. And you, Kevin, what, uh, what, what is your perspective and how do you think the, the Treasury Select Committee colleagues see this also? Well, I think all this is based around trying to increase competition in the sector, which I think has been a huge success, actually. I mean, you know, seeing challenge banks, fintechs come through and very successfully eating into the market share of SME finance, which is great. Um, that was reversed, to, as Dan was alluding to, reversed to a great extent in in 2019, 2021, uh, 2021, 22 rather, through because of the bounce back loans and the lack of access of people like Walker and and uh, um, Tide and others in the, able to, in the ability to access the funds to, to be able to lend. If you're lending at 2.5%, you've got to be borrowing at 1%. The only place you borrow at 1% was through the term funding scheme for SMEs, which wasn't open to non-bank lenders. So you really then reverse lots of the progress you'd made in terms of this 80% stranglehold that big banks had over SMEs, SME finance, um, which had been reversing, and that was more like 60-40, um, um, but then went back to 80-20 again, and now it's coming back to 60-40 again, which is which is good. So we are seeing uh, people moving back to, uh, to more choice as we move down the road. Um, so I think, I mean, some of the stuff that, that's... So sort of fintechs are doing. I was talking to IWACO quite recently, and they, they were lending money like in 20 seconds to SMEs, not through the bounce back loan stuff, just general decisions because of it. all this stuff is automated. The credit checks and the like and the credit assessments are done in a, a different fashion. We've got to make that easier uh, so we can do that more often. So there's something in the Bank of, Bank of England has been looking at trying to take forward called legal entity identifiers, which do mm. exist now. We're making those... Uh, more workable, so you, all SMEs effectively can do, can build automatically through open banking, open finance is is a real little credit file that that easy then for a 
a lender to assess risk on that SME and provide the finance very quickly. So work on that, the Treasury, working with Bank of England, the FCA, working on that, making that more, um, more relevant and useful to, to lenders would be really important as part of this. Um, I think the other thing I'd say, the thing that's not working very well at the moment is the banking referral scheme. So when you go into a, into a high street lender and say, well, okay, I'm with HSBC, can I borrow 50 grand for to do this, uh, expand my business this way? And they say no, then that's supposed to go into like referral schemes. Other lenders can look at that and you can get people saying, well, I'll lend you the money. doesn't work. Most of that stuff is not referred into the banking referral scheme. Most of the, most of the time, an application is not even completed. And that needs to happen before it goes into the banking referral scheme. So a reworking of that to, to bring about genuine competition between, um, between lenders. Um, I know it's been mooted even suggesting SME goes in there first rather than going to the bank first. And then that's kind of disseminated and people can decide whether this is a good risk or not. Some kind of reverse that process or make it mandatory so you get more... Uh, more SMEs going into that scheme who are looking for finance and there's in true competition for um, for that that SME's business in terms of finance. All those kind of things will make it easier for fintechs to take advantage of the opportunities in SME finance. That's correct. I uh, thank you very much for all of your contributions. It has been a very interesting discussion and I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you.